So today is January 28th, 2018. And the title of our message is Initiate. It's a bloody process. Initiate. It's a bloody process. Man, what an overwhelming feeling in worship this morning. Because you guys feel his presence? Yes. Because you feel his presence? Yes. So we've arrived at the second to last message in the Talmudim series. What we don't want you guys to forget is these messages are all in line with each other. Amen. We've gone through T, the A, the L, the M, the I, the D, and now we're right at the second I. They're all one piece that fits into one puzzle. And I want you guys to get this. What I don't want you to, what I want, what I don't want you to lose is the messages and the importance of directing you, pressing you, correcting you, telling you to press into to discipleship. None of these messages are unrelated. And so with that being said, we want, to look at, we want to look at this from the point of the disciples when they got initiated. So turn in your book, in your Bible, to Matthew 28. Amen. What a good place to start. Amen. Now, it didn't escape our thought or knowledge that you guys have probably read this passage a lot yeah. over your walk with the Lord. It's an extremely popular, well-trodden passage in the Word. Let's look at this passage with the illusion of the first time this morning. Give me Acts, Acts chapter 1. Raise your hand in here. Give me some Acts chapter 1 in here. Let's implement that kind of teaching this morning as we read this Word. Amen. We're going to start in Matthew 28. We're going to start in verse 16. Are you guys there? Yeah. Amen. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. You see, right here we learn right off the bat, first scripture. What you learn right here is that obedience is never out of style and it never expires. Amen. Amen. If the disciples hadn't have showed up on that mountain where Jesus had told them to go, then guess what? They're never getting initiated. They're never getting ordained into their functions, never getting uh, the pathway into their callings. They're never getting to the place where Jesus had worked for three and a half years to get them to that point. They're never getting there if they don't obey and they don't go to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. Obedience never ends in the life of a disciple. And guess what? Discipleship never ends in your life either. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Wow. There might even be some people sitting in these seats this morning that are doubting the discipleship process. Still, after, after six and now seven teachings on discipleship, out of countless hours, of scriptures and revelation, there still might be some of you who are sitting in these seats this morning who are doubting the Talmudim discipleship process in your own life. We got to fix this thing, guys. Yeah. Verse 18 says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Wow. When Jesus says, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, what do you think he meant by that statement? If all really does mean all, and everything does mean everything, then what Jesus said is, everything I commanded you, everything I showed you, everything I displayed and modeled for you, everything that I did in my life, I want you to take that, and at this point in initiation, I want you to go run with it. That's heavy. Yeah. Yeah. Everything that Jesus did, we only have a fraction of, of the things that Jesus did according to the book of John. 
We only have just a tiny bit, but everything that Jesus did, we're supposed to put all that on? These disciples are supposed to take that and run with it? The answer is yes. Yeah. Now that, that sounds like a daunting call. Yeah. That sounds really, really daunting. Imagine what you're getting here at LCM. Sitting here this morning, imagine the worship, the impre incredible depth of the presence of God that you're getting here. The incredible depth of revelation and teaching that you're getting from these pastors and elders. Incredible depth of fellowship. Incredible depth of correction. Now imagine that you're at that initiation process. And tomorrow morning when you wake up, you don't get it anymore. You don't get this fellowship any longer. You're initiated into your own calling, your own function, your own path, and you're gone. How does that make you feel? That's the place that the disciples are at right here. Yeah. Jesus is talking to them and he's saying, look, I'm going away. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send you the counselor and he's going to help you and lead you into all truth. But me, my physical presence here in a body, I'm out of here. This is a crazy spot to be in. You've got to put yourself in these guys' shoes. Think about Brent. Think about Buddy. These guys have been initiated into their callings. Yeah. They've been ordained. They've been sent out. They're, st they're sitting there in different nations away from this. And they've got to figure out how to implement everything that Jesus and their disciples, disciples have taught them. That is crazy, guys. Yeah. Are you ready for that? <laughs> sitting right here this morning, are you ready for that? that kind of weight on your shoulders? Are you ready for that kind of responsibility? We still have work to do in the Talmudim process. It's a process that's proven itself and we have work to do. We've got to figure out where we're stalling out in the Talmudim process. We've got to figure out where our car is stalling. We've got to figure it out, fix it, and keep ourselves moving in the process. Amen? That's a good word. So initiation into what? What are we being initiated into? We're being initiated into the things that you're already supposed to be doing. Amen. Amen. So are you living your life now like you could be initiated at any moment? Mm -hmm. When you're initiated, it's just the recognition of the things that you and your family were already doing. That's true. It's not a magical day where all the authority of making disciples and pastoring a church and a group of people is dumped on your shoulders because you've been in a church long enough. You have, have to have been doing all the things that it takes to be initiated. Amen. So we, we compiled a list of take in, attach, lavish, that we're going to walk through. And we're going to portray to you that it is a uh, bloody process. So, can you say bloody process? Bloody process. Before we go into this, I want you to ask yourself where you are in the Talmudim. Are you still taken in? Are you waiting to be taken in? Have you attached yourself? Are you uh, implementing the things? Or are you implementing and being directed? You need to ask yourself that as we work through these and check your heart. Because at the end of this message, with the word guiding you, you have a chance to know exactly where you are, what you're supposed to do, and start living like you could be initiated at any moment. Amen. So the first one is take in. Being taken in is like being reborn into a completely new way of life. Yeah. Birth is a bloody process. Yes. Somebody say, say birth is a bloody process. Yes. Birth, is Come a bloody on. process. birth is a bloody process. Birth, birth is a bloody process. Bloody process. We're going to go through a lot of bloody processes this morning. Yeah. You're going to have to stick with us because it's going to get pretty bloody and messy in this place. Yeah. It's true. All right? So you guys got to pay attention. Birth is a bloody process. Every single one of these that we're going to go through this morning, every take in, attach, every single letter of this Talmudim process, we're going to show you how bloody it can get. Blood is essential to your atonement and survival. Yeah. It's true. 
It's essential to the atonement and survival of the brothers and sisters sitting to your right and left. It's essential to the atonement and survival of the entire world. So as we're going through this, you have to remember that discipleship is a bloody process. You guys got that? Yeah. Amen. The A in Talmudim is attach. To be attached, you will have to detach. Detachment is a bloody process. Say bloody process. Bloody process. So what does that mean? It means that you have to cut things out of your life. It means whatever it is that is causing you to stumble, you have to cut out in order to be attached to the leadership, in order to be attached to your pastors, in order to be attached to the elders. So ask yourself today, LCM, what needs to be cut out of your life so you can be fully attached, yeah. fully invested into this body? Mm -hmm. yep. Lavish. Discipleship is the lavishing of kingdom principles onto you and onto others. Taking the time to lavish is a bloody process. Yeah. Let me tell you why. Because it takes all of your effort to lavish onto somebody else or to be lavished upon. It takes a tremendous amount of sacrifice. It takes a tremendous amount of cutting out of your life painfully the things that don't belong so that you can position yourself to be lavished upon. Lavishment is a bloody process. Yeah. Yeah. Model. Trying to fit the model is a strenuous endeavor. Being made into the image of Christ means cutting off what doesn't belong and putting on what does. And that's a bloody process. What do you need to cut off today? Yeah. What, what is making you look like something that's not Christ? What are the things that you're attaching to yourself? It could be the clothes that you're wearing. It could be the way that you're speaking, the way that you're reading the word, or the way that you're attaching yourself to things that aren't, aren't good, like Netflix or video games. You need to cut these things from your life, and it's going to be a bloody process. Yeah. For implement, you are going to stub your toe. Say, stub your toe. Stub your toe. And say, fall short. Fall short. You are going to come face to face with your inadequacies, but you are going to have to try anyways because it's a bloody process. Yeah. That's right. It's a bloody process. You're going to have to try. You're going to have to get, get beyond the fact that you, you cannot do it in your own strength. You know what God does? The Lord is funny. He calls you what you are not so you can be exactly what he has made you to be. Yeah. What does that mean? He's called you what you are absolutely not in your own strength so you can be exactly what he has called you to be in his strength. Amen. So you need his Holy Spirit. You need his Holy Spirit to press through, to realize that when you look and you say, Lord, I can't do this on my own, but your spirit would allow me to do this. It allows you to implement. It allows you to step forward. It allows you to push back the fears, like it says in 2 Timothy 1.7, that he hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and self-discipline. It's going to require you to realize that you are going to stub your toe. You are going to fall short sometimes, but he's going to pick you up because his mighty right arm, say mighty right arm, mighty right arm. is mighty to save. Amen. After implement, we have direct. When you press into discipleship, the hammer of direction is going to hit you time and time again. Yeah, it it's going to hurt because what? It's a bloody process. Yeah. It's going to hurt because it's a bloody process. Do you guys remember Wednesday? Do you remember what Peyton preached? Do you remember that revelation that we got from Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 11 and 12? Firmly embedded nails. To be a firmly embedded disciple, it takes serious hammering. You hearing me? Yeah. <laughs> You're going to have to get destroyed so that you can get embedded. And that's a bloody process. Yeah. You're going to have to get stuff ripped away from you to get embedded. That's a bloody process. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to get the harshest sometimes correction of your life and take it with a smile on your face, with joy in your countenance, say thank you and go and implement it because it's a bloody process. Yeah. Direction is really, really, really tough. And I tell you the truth, a lot of, a lot, many, almost most Christians can't. They can't take the direction. And they stall out right there. Because when they get the rebuke, when they get the correction, their pride just doesn't allow them to be firmly embedded. The hammer misses its mark on their heart. 
And it causes them never to be firmly embedded, hmm. never to reach that process of initiation that they have to, that they must reach, because it's God's will for your life. Direct is a bloody process. Amen. Do you remember last week, Buddy stood up here, the pastor stood with him, they touched his ear, his thumb, and his toe. Every point up to being initiated in the Talmudim series has been a bloody process. Yeah. It has been bloody. You've been, you've been directed and lavished upon, and it's all leading to this point of initiation. And even your initiation is a bloody process where they anoint your ear with blood, your thumb with blood, your toe with blood. Even your initiation is a bloody process. Magnify. Blazing a new trail in unfamiliar territory is the epitome of difficulty. Christ's blood never stops giving you life. The bloody process never ends for a Talmud of Christ. So when I look at Buddy Brasso, we've initiated you. Now it's time to magnify the teaching that we've put into you, the passage have put into you, and magnified in the land of Peru. And it's a bloody process, and it never stops, like my brother said. You have to press in. You can never stop. You can never back up, shut up, or let up. Because it's your job. The spirit he has put in you is to magnify. So does anybody remember what the word in Hebrew for disciple is? Talmud. Talmud or plural Talmudim. That word Talmud, it has a very interesting meaning in paleo. As we're talking about discipleship being a bloody process, the paleo should be coming back to you in this moment. If you remember... It's a tav, it's a lamid, it's a mem, it's a dalit. Yeah. A monument to a way of life marked by a bloody door. Wow. So many times we can get caught up in saying the bloody door is up there. And when I get initiated, then I'll reach the bloody door and I'll know that that's going to be a bloody process to be initiated and go off by myself. We're standing up here this morning to tell you that the door isn't the only thing that's bloody. The whole process itself is bloody. That's right. The whole process of creating a Talmud or creating Talmudim is a bloody, nasty process that we must go through. Yeah. It's a bloody process. Yeah. I want to go back to Matthew 28. Look at verse 19. says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you to the very end of the age. That's a big task. They weren't bringing people to Jesus so Jesus could teach them. Jesus was sending them out to teach the people. That's right. So when we think of the Great Commission as it's referred to, it wasn't people who had just entered into the kingdom or entered into discipleship that Jesus is entrusting the gospel to. They were fully trained men. And if that makes your heart sink because you know you've been entrusted with the gospel, but you don't feel equipped to teach, well, then maybe your discipleship process isn't finished, and that's okay. The goal is to take you from being a babe to being a full-grown man in Christ, able to teach and equip others to teach. Yeah. So as we work back through Take In, we're going we're gonna to give you a picture of the things that will hinder you in that process and also show you from the word how people did this rightly. So let's jump in to Take In. Open in your Bibles to Numbers 14 and find verse 20 when you get there. If you remember, being taken in is like being reborn into a completely new way of life. Because birth is a bloody process. As you guys are turning to Numbers 14, I want to just reiterate that if you don't feel like you're at that point where you can take Jesus' teachings in their entirety, where you can grab a hold 
of the life of Christ and put it on display? You don't feel like you're at that point where you're a, a firmly embedded nail that's able to take what you've learned in its entirety and push it forward in a foreign land or in a, a land that's not well trodden yet or in untrodden territory anywhere. If you don't feel that way, it's okay. You're just somewhere along the process. Maybe you are still trying to implement the teachings that are taught here in this church. That's okay. Learn to be a master over the implementation of what is taught. Yeah. Maybe you're still learning to model what you're seeing in your pastors and your elders. That's okay. Model it with all your heart. Devote yourself to the task. Keep going forward. Don't let yourself stall out on these. Maybe you're still trying to attach. Maybe you've been taken in and you're, you're still trying to figure out how you're going to attach yourself fully, wholeheartedly to your discipler. That's okay. Just make sure that it gets done. Make sure that you fully attach. Make sure that you put the time in that is necessary for this process. We even have some people in here th this morning that are still struggling, struggling with being taken in. That's okay. As long as the end is you being taken in and continuing in the discipleship process. We've got some people in the back that are still struggling with being taken in. Make sure that you grasp that that's the first barrier of entry into this whole process. We want and need you here. We want you to be here and we need you to be here. The work of God's going to go on, but we want and need you to be with us. You need us and we need you. So don't, don't shy away from the take-in process. If these words are hitting you this morning, then let them hit you and make sure that you're doing something about them as the days go by. Amen. LCM, say take in. Take, take in. in. Say do the work. Do the work. <laughs> we have to do the work, like my brother Nick said. In whatever process that you're in, whether it's take in, lavish, or model, wherever you are, you have to do the work. I, I think that was pointed Take ownership of where you are in your discipleship. No one's going to take ownership of it for you. Yeah. Own it. If you're in the take-in process, say, I'm being taken in. Yeah. And I know where I'm headed. Say, I know where I'm headed. I know where I'm headed. Or maybe you're at model and you're, you're struggling through it. But it's your position and your place in discipleship. Don't let anyone take it from you by, or even yourself take it from yourself. Uh, don't. Don't fool yourself into thinking, well, I'm not where that person is, so uh, I want to be like them. And then you try to act like someone who's in the initiate, but you're still in model. Mm. That's the word. Yeah. You'll end up being a sheep that sneaks outside the, sneak, uh, the sheep pen and then tries to enter in by another way. Wow. So let's jump into Numbers 14. That's where we left off. Verse 20. The Lord repri replied, I have forgiven them. As you asked. Nevertheless, as surely as I live and as surely as the glory of the Lord fills, this, fills the whole earth, not one of the men who saw my glory and the miraculous signs I performed in Egypt, in the desert, uh, but who disobeyed and tested me ten times, not one of them will ever see the land I promised on oath to their forefathers. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. Mm. People who had the chance to go into the promised land were seduced away by their fleshly appetite. Yeah. They were seduced away by the things of this world. They were lusting after Egypt. What are you lusting after right now? What are you thinking about getting to right now? Are you waiting to get to something after, after church or this week? Or have you already planned to miss a meeting to do something that you know is carnal? Wow. Mm. That is being seduced away. Wow. And we placed it and take in because it happens so often. When people enter into discipleship, they forget to be born again. And they want to just reap the benefits of the kingdom and being under good teachers without actually being born again. And they come in and immediately are seduced away in a yeah. second. Uh, for me, I was almost seduced away. Almost. But I triumphed over it. Amen. I, I had entered into discipleship. It's what I wanted. 
but I had already formulated for myself in a year to go and move and detach myself. I was almost seduced away. And if you don't examine your hearts right now, you may be setting yourself up to sedu be seduced away. Wow. Another thing, just thought of this. We always, I always think of physical things seducing people away. His fear seduced you. Think about it. What are you afraid of? Has fear seduced you into apathy, into being cold? Has fear killed you where you've, you've sat here for 10, 15, 20 years and done absolutely nothing? You have been seduced by your own fears. Wow. And if you spend 20 years with something and it pampers you, something like fear, it makes you feel like you're humble, you end up loving something like that. And you have a 20-year relationship with it. You've been seduced from discipleship. You've been seduced from the kingdom. Wow. Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 3. You have to pardon the, the dancing. I, this chord is everywhere. <laughs> I'm used to it being on a stand. There. 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 Let's see how this was done correctly and glean some encouragement from it. Just because I like it. Say it's a bloody process. It's a bloody process. All right, verse 13. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12, designating them apostles, that they might be with him. With who? Him. Him. Jesus. Amen. Inseparable. Unable to be seduced away. No matter the cost, whether they had to give up jobs, whether they had to give up family, whether they had to leave their, their parents' dead bodies unburied, they did it because discipleship is a bloody process. Yeah. It doesn't matter what it's going to cost you, how it's going to hurt you. If you know where discipleship is happening and who the Lord has told you to attach yourself to, then you run after it. It's going to be a bloody process, and it will cost you everything, yeah. but you will reap all the fruits of the kingdom if you stick to it and you are not seduced away. Amen. We hadn't caught up yet. This morning we're talking about each stage yeah. up to initiation, and we're talking to our body about what, what happens when people don't reach that stage of initiation, how they get off track, how they're seduced away by something, what causes us to fail to reach initiation and magnify and beyond. This is what we're talking about this morning. Couldn't be any more pertinent to us this morning as it is right now. The next one is attach. If you remember to be attached, you will have to detach. Detachment is a bloody process. Yeah. Yeah. Turn to Ruth chapter 1 with me. Had to make sure that there's not a baby in here. <laughs> if I'm trying to pick up this baby carrier, and I'm carrying it around, and all of a sudden I need to pick up Andrew, what, what, what is the issue here? What's happening? Uh, Oh, you got a oh. baby carrier. Sorry, Andrew. I just can't pick you up, man. I'm holding too much in my hands already. What do you need to throw down like that baby carrier? Without the baby, of course. But what do you need to throw down? See, to detach yourself from something like that, in order to pick something else, it's essential to this process. Yeah. It has to happen. You have to let go. Release your death grip on one thing in order for you to pick up what is actually, truly life. In Ruth chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 9. It says, in the middle of 9, it says, Then she, talking about Naomi, kissed them, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. This is Orpah and Ruth. Ruth, Naomi's trying to send them away. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. 
Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, why would you wait until they grew up? Why would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. For these two women who professed their attachment to Naomi, they really had to count the cost. What was it going to cost Orpah and Ruth, supposedly, to attach themselves to Naomi, to not go back to their homeland, to not go back to the well-trodden lands that they had trodden on before they had a radical experience? See, it would have... It's supposedly going to cost them a lot. And they had to count that cost. We're not going to have husbands. We're not going to have children. We're not going to have generations coming after us. Maybe for you, it's, I'm not going to have as much fun as I could have. If I attached here, then my life is it's going to be boring. I'm just not going to get the same experiences. You know, I, I really like sitting there on, on Saturday and watching football bowl games. I just... It's something that I love to do. You have to count that cost. Because that's not something that we do in this place. It's not the way of life that we're propitiating here. You have to count the attachment cost. Can I tell you something? Orpah wept and kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. When she found out what it was going to cost, she said, see ya, I'm out of here. I'm not coming back. Orpah detached herself by breaking fellowship, breaking her word, breaking the call of God on her life, and breaking God's heart. Wow. Yeah. She broke it all. See, when you break fellowship, to attach yourself to something else that is not in the lifestyle and the way of life that is being handed down to you directly from Jesus all the way through the generations, through the word of God, and into your life and into your family's life, that's dangerous. That could very well may be the thing that is stalling out your walk right now today. You're just not willing to attach yourself the way that you need to. The secret sowed in this passage that I can see in it right now is that Ruth not only got a husband, she got the best husband. Yeah. Yeah. That Ruth not only got children, she got some of the best children in the world. Yeah. She was in the line of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Yeah. She got way more than she could ever have asked for or imagined. And it's because she gave up what she thought was an opportunity, what she thought would be fun, what she thought she wanted to live her life like. She gave it up for the pattern of Christ. She did that and she got way more than she could have ever, ever imagined. Let's go to John chapter 6, verse 66, and look how the disciples did this rightly. is so exciting and encouraging to see what the disciples did in John chapter 6 because it says many, many of the, of the disciples turned away. Many of them turned away because it was so hard, because they weren't hearing exactly what they wanted to hear, because the attachment process would have demanded too much from them and they just said it's not worth it. I'm just going to turn back. I'm going to turn away from this opportunity. Because something else is more enticing to me. Verse 67 says, You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Do you guys have this revelation yet like Peter had? Do you have this revelation that there is life here? That the very words of life are in this place. The very words of life are sitting here in this room. 
There's nothing special about the building. There's something tremendously special about the men and women sitting in this room. Amen. It's such a special thing to participate in this. The disciples knew what it was going to cost them. Yet they still cried out, you have the words of life and we're not going anywhere. I know what you're saying is hard, but I also know that you've been faithful. Jesus, you've lived a faithful life. I've seen the fruit of your life and I know that what you're telling me right now is tremendously hard. But I'm going to stick around and I'm going to keep getting discipled and I'm going to keep pressing through because I need to. And I know that it's right. I'm not going to get offended anymore. I'm not going to run away from that correction. I'm not going to listen and nod my head and go away and just forget about it. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to stick around and I'm going to keep getting it because it's life. Amen. Discipleship is a bloody process. Amen. <clears throat> it is a bloody process. Turn to 2 Samuel chapter 18. Stay there when you are there. To shma. What does it mean to, to shma? To hear, to listen or obey. To listen with the intent to obey. You guys in 2 Samuel 18? Yes. Looking at lavish, it says, Discipleship is the lavishing of kingdom principles into you and others. Taking the time to lavish is a bloody process. In 2 Samuel 18, starting in verse 20, say there when you're there. It says, you are not the one to take the news today, Joab told him. You may take the news another time, but you must not do so today because the king's son is dead. Then Joab said to the Cushite, go tell the king what you have seen. The Cushite bowed down before Joab and ran off. Amahaz, son of Zadok, said to Joab, come what may, please let me run behind the Cushite. But Joab replied, my son, why do you want to go? You don't have any news that will bring your reward. Verse 23, he said, come what may, I want to run. So Joab said, run. Then Amahaz ran by the way of the plain and outran the Cushite. The backstory to this in 2 Samuel 18 is that Absalom has just been killed. King David's son. And Joab wanted to send the Cushite to deliver this news. But here you have Amahaz wanted to deliver the news on his behalf. He wanted to go his own way. What he failed to realize is that Joab was actually trying to lavish upon him kingdom principles. The problem with Amahaz was he wasn't willing to shma. He wasn't willing to listen with the intent of obeying. Now ask yourself, since you've been in this body, since you've been at this church, how many times have you found yourself with the pastors talking to you, giving you advice, you nod your head, you say, yeah, pastor, that's exactly what I'm going to do. But as soon as you turn and make that 180, you do exactly what you want to do. Wow. That's not listening with the intent of obeying. That's not sh to shema. Yeah. And we see this in Amaha's life, where in verse, um, in verse 22, it says, come what may, let me run behind the Kushite. Joab goes on to say, why do you want to go? You don't have any news that's going to bring your reward. You don't have anything that's going to be a profit to you by going to do this. See, Joab wanted to lavish kingdom principles at Amahaz, but Amahaz was not able to receive them. He did not shma. He had no idea that his life was in jeopardy. What Joab knew that Amahaz did not know is that there have been men who have come before him who have delivered news to King David about other men dying, and King David has put them to death. Take, sec take 2 Samuel 1, for example. With the man that came to David and said, Saul has been put to death. He thought he was going to get a reward. But King David put him to death. He's like, How, were you not scared to touch the Lord's anointed? What Amahaz does not know is that Joab is trying to protect him. He has his best interest in mind. What he wanted to do was, Amahaz wanted to show that he was further along the discipleship process than he ever really was. Wow. Just let that sit in. Do you get a revelation and you're not willing to listen to anybody else. You just want to share whatever you want to share. Do you want to skip from being in the taking process all the way to magnify? Think about this. This is a relationship between Joab and Amahaz. And he's trying to disciple him. He's trying to lavish upon him kingdom 
principles. He's trying to direct them. He's trying to correct them to protect his own life. And Emma has, has no idea in the very same way that Oprah had no idea by breaking her fellowship, breaking the word, breaking God's heart and breaking the call was going to completely destroy her legacy. Just think about that. Amaz is in this situation. You know what he does? He runs ahead. He runs and skips along. He outruns the Cushite. And he goes on to get in front of King David. And King David looks ahead when they called him out and said, oh, that's Amaz. That's a good man. He's, he's coming to bring good news. When he shows up, King David asks him, said, hey, what happened? Is my son well? Is my son Absalom safe? You know what he says? I saw a great... I saw great confusion. I have no idea what happened. <laughs> you know what King David told him? He said, step to the side. That's what happens when you think you're further along than you really are in discipleship. Wow. When you're trying to jump the gun, trying to skip a grade. It doesn't work like that. It's a bloody process. Say it's a bloody process. It's a bloody process. It's a bloody process that we have to go through. The T leads up to the M. To magnify. Turn to Luke 9. While you're turning there, I want to propose to you that Ahimaaz suffered from premature initiation. That's right. Nobody in here wants to suffer from premature initiation, do you? No. That's a nasty thing. It's gripping this generation like the plague. Don't get caught up in premature initiation. You hear that? Make sure you know exactly where you are in the discipleship process. Own it like Peyton was talking about and keep going. Yeah. Amen. You guys in Luke 9? Yeah. Everyone there? Yeah. In Luke 9, 57, starting in verse 57, it says, As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, to him is Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. What's interesting about this is Jesus is walking along, and this man says, I am willing to follow you wherever you go. You know what Jesus' response is? Foxes, they, they have holes, and birds of the, of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. You know what he's saying? Look, you're so eager. You're saying that you're, you're following, but you have not counted the cost. You're saying, Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. But what Jesus is saying to him by saying this, he's actually, he's, he's speaking into his life. When he says, you really want to follow me? You have no idea what I'm going to sleep tonight. Think about that. I'll follow you wherever you go, but you've never counted the cost. And Jesus said, I don't think you're ready for what's to come. When you look at the pastors, when you look at the elders, when you look at their lives, you say, I want to do what, you want, what you're doing right now. I want to be where you are. If you counted the cost. If you count what it's going to cost you, this young man here is saying, I'm, I'm ready to follow you. I'm ready to run now like Emma has. But he hasn't counted the cost. He has no idea. It's a, it's a bloody process. He has no idea what's going to cost him. He has no idea where Jesus is going to even sleep that night. Yeah. And so if he's willing to follow him, that means he has to relinquish all. That means, that means he has to detach from the things of the world. In verse 59, it says, he said to another man, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. What are you still holding on to that the Lord is saying, cut away? I was talking to my brothers earlier this morning. I said, there's nobody in LCM that's here by accident. When I speak to each and every single one of you that the Lord has placed here, you didn't just wake up, uh, search a random church, and, and land your hand on LCM. Everybody has a unique testimony of how God has brought them here. There are people that are sitting here right now who are called to the nations. But what are you doing with it right now? What are you doing with that prophecy that God has given you? What are you doing with those visions, those words that have come forth? What have you done with the things that you've laid to the side? The memorial stones that you're supposed to put in your backpack and walk the walk, not just talk the talk. The things that you've placed to the side. Here in verse uh, 59, it says, let me, go for, let me first go and bury my father. Verse 6, Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Verse 61, still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts his hand to the plow and look back is fit for the service of the kingdom of God. The thing is, we have to understand what it means to be lavish. When we think about lavishment, it's like, man, everything that's positive. But you have to understand that correction is also lavishment. It's saving your life. Yes. It's saving your life. 
Here are all these men saying, I'm going to follow you, Jesus, wherever you go. I want to do what you do. Have you counted the cost to stand, to stand where I stand? This was Jesus, to stand where I'm standing, this is what Jesus is saying. You have to count the cost. You have to detach yourself. You have to be taken in. And what's interesting about this is these men heard exactly what Jesus said, but they had no intent of obeying him. They didn't shma. They did not shma. LCM. Are you going to shma today? Yes. Are you going to hear the messages that are coming from this pulpit? Because we're preaching our hearts out. Yeah. We're in the seventh week. And the last thing we don't want you to do is to get a message, feel good about yourself, walk out of the door, and just scatter the revelation everywhere. We have to get this right. Oh, we're picking up steam, church. It's getting more bloody. Is discipleship a bloody process? Yes. Let's remember that model, it, being a model, is a strenuous endeavor. And being made into the image of Christ means cutting off what doesn't belong and putting on what does. Turn to 2 Thessalonians 3. Put your finger on verse 7. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked night and day, laboring and toiling, so that we, could not, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. We did this not because we do not have the right to such help, but in order to make ourselves a model. Oh. Yeah. For you to follow. For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. If a man will not work, he shall not eat. You want to ruin the way people view you as a man of God or a woman of God? Be lazy. That will disqualify you. And it will, it's like a watchman sleeping on his post. It's like a shepherd who is too lazy to chase away the predators trying to steal the sheep. Laziness, it's impossible to be lazy and be a Christian. Wow. Oil and water don't mix. Laziness and walking with Jesus does not mix. It is a bloody process. And laziness will want to set in because your flesh is deceptive and selfish. And it wants you to be lazy and it wants you to back up and recant from the things Jesus wants to do in your life. But if you give in to that, you, you will not be a good model. People will not want to follow you. What excuses do you have in your heart and in your mind right now about why you can't keep up with the pace of this church? Just, just think about that for a second. That's sin. You're no different than anybody else sitting in these chairs or up on this stage this morning. Kill it. Yeah. Destroy it. Cut it off. Let the blood flow because discipleship is a bloody process. Yeah. Turn to John 13. I got you now. If you don't turn there, I'll say you're being lazy. Yeah. Let's go to verse 12. A lot of pages turning. That's right. Getting it. Verse 12. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you, he asked them? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. We need to be like Jesus. we got to take off laziness. We need to put on hard work. We need to take off laziness and put on sacrifice. Yeah. We need to stop watching TV and start washing our brother's feet. Mm -hmm. We got to get to work. We got to stop being lazy. 
That means when you hear from God for a brother, you don't sit on the word because you don't feel like your delivery skills are, are good enough. You don't sit on a prophecy in tongues because you think you might sound funny. We have to overcome laziness. And you can, you can say it's fear or you need extra help, but it's laziness. Do you steal people's notes and then preach them as your own revelation? That's laziness. Now, those, those teachings from our pastors are great, but do you attribute them to you doing the work because you were too lazy to do it yourself? <laughs> Can't be lazy. You got to tear yourself from that. You got, you got to get on an altar and sacrifice yourself because discipleship is a what? Bloody process. When you think about this and model, the perfect example of what it means to be a model in Christ is how do you treat one another? How do you treat your brothers? It says in Hebrews that Jesus was the exact representation of, of God, right? And here he is in John speaking. It says, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that's what I am. Yeah. But do what I've done for you to others, to your brothers. So ask yourself today, LCM, how do you treat one another? That's what it means to be a real model. So next is implement. You are going to stub your toe and fall short. You're going to come face to face with your inadequacies, but you're going to have to try anyway. It's a bloody process. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 25. Man, we're going to start in verse 29 here. We're going to look at why we, maybe one of the reasons why we don't implement. Why we don't implement the teachings. Why we don't make them true in our actions. Verse 29 says, once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That's why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, first sell me your birthright. Look, I am about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Esau was raised to be a hunter. He was raised to be a warrior. He was raised to know how to handle a bow, to know how to handle a club. To know, know how to go out in the wilderness for days at a time and survive. He, he was raised as a tough, tough disciple. One thing was a stumbling block for him, though. Mm. His stubbornness in his life fostered the inability to control his own appetite. Wow. He was stubborn. He knew what his flesh wanted. And he was going to get it, by golly. Hmm. He was going to get whatever his flesh wanted. You want my birthright? You want my initiation? You want my future? Take it. I'm starving right now, and I'm going to feed my flesh. Wow. I'm going to do that right now instead of being where I know I'm supposed to be, instead of doing what I know I'm supposed to be doing. I'm just going to throw my hands up in the air and feed my flesh. I'm going to trade it all in. I don't know how a pastor can get up on a Monday night and say, you are a fool if you have game consoles in your household and you'd be sitting here today and you still have a game console in your household. I don't know how, I don't know how a disciple of Christ and of this body adhering to the example, eating up ground in this, in this Talmudin process, I don't know how that can happen. Except for the word shows us, doesn't it? Yeah. It's stubbornness. It's just an easier way to do things. Yeah. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12 and see. 
Because after that, I need a little bit of encouragement. I don't know about you guys. That's a hard word. We need to be approaching this, this discipleship with a kind of tenacity. A tenacity like we see in Esau minus the stubbornness. If we're stubborn for Christ, if we're stubborn for discipleship, if we say, I'm going to be stubborn in being at your house tonight. I'm going to be stubborn. Uh, give me your feedback. I know that I didn't do it perfectly. I know that what I did wasn't flawless. I need your feedback. I'm going to be stubborn. I'm going to sit right here until you correct me in some way because I know that you're farther along than I am. That kind of stubbornness is an A plus in the kingdom. If you want to be stubborn, be stubborn in that way. Verse 16 says, See that no one is sexually immoral or is godless like Esau, who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. Afterward, as you know, when he wanted to inherit this blessing, he was rejected. He could bring about no change of mind, though he sought the blessing with tears. I don't want to keep banging my head against the wall over and over and over again because I'm too stubborn. Amen. In Matthew 14, we find out a beautiful example of how we can get this right. Yeah, turn with me. There. 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 In verse 15, it says, As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Who are the disciples talking to? They're talking to Jesus. They're saying, Hey, Jesus, I know you had a plan, but it's getting really late. And out of my own convenience and my own stubbornness, because it's right in my eyes, why don't, why don't we just send the people away? You know, we need a little time. I, I know this discipleship process is important, but, you know, I need some time. I need, you need some time. Let's just send everybody away without feeding them, without giving them what they need. Send them on. What does Jesus say? He replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. Does that terrify anybody in this room? <laughs> Imagine somebody looking at you and saying, hey, we're not going to do that because that's wicked. But what we are going to do is you're going to stand up and you're going to preach. You're going to stand up and you're going to teach. Yeah. Are you guys ready for that? Are you ready for that, that stage of the process? And if you're not, what is your barrier of entry to getting there? What do you need to do to get your feet moving to get to that point? Because the disciples... They didn't even know they were there, but they can do this. Yeah, that's right. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me, he said, and he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. The disciples here repented of their own course. Yeah. They said, it's not worth it. The ease is not worth it. My own stubborn heart, it's not worth it. Jesus, rabbi, discipler, I need you to show me what I'm capable of because I don't think that I'm capable of doing that. I don't think I have the resources to be able to do what you're asking me to do. Do you guys have your ears open to that this morning? For some of you sitting in this room, I would say most of you, you're actually more capable than you think that you are. That's true. And you just need a discipler to come over and say, man, you got this. You got this, man. Go forward. Teach, teach this lesson, Peyton. You got this, man. Get up and get a guitar and lead worship. He did it. He got this. For most in this room, get your ears open. Be stubborn about discipleship, and when you make that transition from stubbornness in your flesh to stubbornness about discipleship, then you're going to start realizing that you have a plethora, a tremendous amount of things to offer the kingdom. Amen. Amen. Discipleship is a bloody process. Indirect says when you press into discipleship, 
the hammer of direction is going to hit you time and time again. <laughs> it's going to hurt because it's a bloody process. Direction in the life of a Christian is life-saving. Yes. Direction is life-saving. Turn to 1 Kings 13. We're going we're gonna to see a man who received direction from the Lord and how he handled it. Say there when you're there. There. In 1 Kings 13, starting in verse 8, it says, But the man of God answered the king, Even if you were to give me half of your possessions, I would not go with you, nor would I eat bread or drink water there. For I was commanded by the word of the Lord, You must not eat, say eat, eat. or drink, say drink, drink, water or return by the way you came. So he took another road and did not return by the way he had come to Bethel. See, this, this man of God from Judah received revelation from the Lord to go out to prophesy. And he told them that when you go there, don't eat, don't drink, leave, and go exactly where I'm telling you to go. The Lord was directing him. And so when we read in verse 10, he says he took another road and did not return by the way he had come to Bethel. So this man of God, he passed the first test because the king said, hey, just spend some time with me, you know, uh, compromise a little bit, eat, drink something. He says, no. I'm going to take another road. I refuse to eat or drink it. So he passed the first test. He didn't take the same road that he came by. He took the direction of the Lord and he implemented it by action. But when we pick him in verse 15, let's see what happens to him. It says, so the prophet said to him, and this prophet is another prophet, an older prophet. So in this story, we have a younger prophet, the man of God from Judah, and an older prophet who heard about this man of God from Judah and what he prophesied in front of the king. And so he goes after him in verse 15 and says, So the prophet said to him, Come home with me and eat. The man of God said, I cannot turn back and go with you, nor can I eat bread or drink water with you in this place. So, so far he's doing pretty good. He's, he said the exact same thing he already said to the king. In verse 17 he says, I have been told by the word of the Lord, you must not, say must not, must not. eat bread or drink water there or return by the way you came. He's saying exactly what he said to the king. In verse 18, the old prophet answered him, I too am a prophet as you are. And an angel said to me by the word of the Lord, bring him back with you to your house so that he may eat bread and drink water. The man of God from Judah is in a, in a hard place, in a hard place right now. He just told the old prophet, I receive a word from the Lord saying I must not eat or drink in this place. You know what the old prophet says? I'm, I'm, a, I'm a prophet as well. I heard, from the, I heard from the Lord, and an angel told me that you must do contradictory what the Lord is telling you to do. Just think about this. I remember when I first got born again in, in 2015. Man, the zeal and the fire that I had, right? Going after, just evangelizing, doing everything I could possibly because I was so in love with Jesus. He has broken my chains. And you know what I ran across 99.9% of the time? Older Christians who always told me, hey, man, you might want to slow down a little bit. That fire is going to die off. That fire is going to die off. That's, not, that's exactly what the old prophet is telling him. Yeah. yeah, I heard what you said about you getting a divine revelation from the Lord, but I tell him a prophet because I've already crop compromised, and I want you to compromise as well. And in my case, I was getting discouraged because I didn't have LCM. I didn't have this. I was just running. But when I met the pastors, and I met the body, and I met the men and women in this, in this fellowship, and I saw the fire, and I see... Elder Charlie, at his age, to having the same fire, and look at Elder Bob and see the fire that he has, that gives me hope because these men are like Caleb to me. He said, I am still strong as I was when Moses was still alive to go slay those giants. Yeah. And so the man of God here received direction from the Lord, a word from the Lord. What has the Lord given to you, those prophecies? What has he given to you and someone is trying to cut you off? What is trying to cut you off? What is trying to seduce you away? Let's find out what he did. It says in verse 18, I tell him a prophet as you are, and as the angel said, and the angel said to me by the word of the Lord, bring him back with you to your house so that he may eat bread and drink water. But he was lying. Verse 19, so the man of God returned with him and ate and drank at his house. The man of God received revelation from the Lord, 
And in that moment, he did so well in front of the king. He did so well in his first interaction with the older prophet. And here we, here we have, he says that the older man, the older prophet said that I heard from an angel. Look at, look at that in light of the New Testament when it says that Satan has masquerading angels. Angels of light masquerading as angels of light. Here's a man saying, I received directly a word from the Lord. And you're telling me you heard from some angel? Contradictory to each other. Whatever's trying to sneak up in your life, you have to cut it off. You can't compromise. Amen. And unfortunately, in the, in the young prophet's life, he compromised. It says in verse 19, he returned with him and ate at his house. The young prophet cast aside the direction he received, and he compromised. What was his demise? When you keep reading, you find out that the Lord actually moves on the older prophet to prophesy against the man of God from Judah, the younger one, that he was going to die because he didn't listen to the word of the Lord. When you keep reading, you find out that a lion met him on the road and he killed him. His life was over. His calling was over. And what's, what's so sad about this is that this man of God from Judah was nameless. And if he would have got this right, look at how, what a legacy he would have left behind. The prophecies that he prophesied against the altar. And here he compromised and his life was over, ending in disgrace, and his calling was unfinished. Wow. One thing that's taken most Christians out is compromise. Yeah. Allowing yourself to be seduced away. The problem with not taking direction or sticking to it makes you vulnerable to compromise. Yeah. But let's look at this in light of something positive in Luke 9. Turn to Luke 9. Luke chapter 9. Say, there when you're there. 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 Everyone there? there? Discover the 10th verse. It says, when the apostles returned, they reported to Jesus what they had done. So the apostles were excited when they came back to Jesus to tell them exactly what they have done. Because he sent them out to go do something. He gave them a direction. And they went out and they didn't compromise. Because they came back and said, look, Lord, look at everything you told us that we could do. And we did it. How incredible is that? In light of the story we just read in, second, in, second King, in 1 Kings 13. So the disciples showed no compromise. They reported everything and benefited themselves from the divine correction and direction that came from Jesus. They died to themselves. They died to their desires. They died to compromise because discipleship is a bloody process. So say, I would not compromise. Say, I would not compromise. LCM, you have to believe that. Because that man of God from Judah thought he would never compromise, but he did. Turn to Hebrews 6. We're not going to compromise, church. We're not going to be seduced away. We're going to be stubborn in discipleship. And we're going to listen. Find verse 7 when you get there. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives a blessing from God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. Even though we speak like this, dear friends, we are confident of better things in your case. Amen. 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 Things that accompany salvation. Yeah. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end. In order, that we, that, uh, in order to make your hope sure, we do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit, inherit what has been promised. Amen. If you don't want to compromise, don't hang around people who have compromised. Wow. If you have compromised, don't try to get other people to compromise to validate the way that you compromised. Wow. That is nasty sin. It makes the Lord mad. It makes me mad. Yeah. Does it make you mad? Yeah. Does it make you mad that someone could come into this church who have, has compromised their faith and try to drag away one of your brothers? Yes. Do you want to fight that person? Right now. Yeah. You want to protect that person? We have to take off our pride. We have to take off 
our entitlement and wash our brother's feet in this way. We can't be lazy and we have to show diligence to the things that we're being brought through in discipleship. Yeah. If you want to be initiated, be diligent. Amen. If you want to be initiated, be humble. If you want to be initiated, be stubborn in discipleship. Yeah. Don't take no for an answer. When they say, we don't have time, say, I don't have time. I need this now. I think, I think your teachers would, would, uh, they would be taken back and they would love it because it would show that their disciples are hungering for the kingdom. Yeah, and the word right. says that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. And the Lord has given them the anointing to fill your hands and your mind and yeah. your ears with it. Yeah. Yeah. You want to be initiated? Go after it. Discipleship is a bloody process. Guys, we're on the home stretch. Turn with us to John 15. We're going to start in verse 13. We've got just a few more concepts to share with you very briefly. I want to make sure that we are here, that we're still listening with the intent to obey. This is about to be really, really good. Yeah. John 15, verse 13. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. Christ called you his friend. In fact, he showed his words by his actions. He laid down his life for you. He laid down his life for me. He called us his friends. The next verse says, you are my friends if you do what I command. Hmm. Christ showed us how to lay down our lives. He commanded us to lay down our lives. I think the biggest barrier to real discipleship process right here in this room is that we don't know how to lay down our life. We don't wake up in the morning saying, how can I lay down my life today? We wake up in the morning saying, what am I going to do with my life today? Wow. If you're stalled out, if you're stuck, if you're in the same process over and over again, if you're running in circles with this thing and you don't know where to go, try laying down your life. Wow. Try waking up tomorrow morning saying, Lord, I'm going to lay down my life today. I'm going to lay down my schedule. I'm going to lay down my priorities. I'm going to lay down everything that I wanted to do today, and I'm going to give it to you. It doesn't sound foreign, but when you put it that way, it sounds a little bit foreign, right? Try laying down your life for the gospel. Laying down your life is a bloody process. To lay down your life like Christ did, it's bloody. It hurts. But discipleship is a bloody process. Verse 15 says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. Guys, you want to continue to be a friend of Christ? Yes. You want to continue to have the revelation from heaven being made known to you, then you have to lay down your life. Yeah. You have to lay down your life day after day. You have to wake up and say, Lord, my life is really yours. Yeah. I'm really going to lay down my life for you today. I'm really going to look at my brothers and lay down my life for them today. I'm really going to trade in my plans for the day and lay down my life for my brothers. I'm really going to do that. You have to. You must lay down your life, and it's bloody. Don't word. turn there. I'm going to read some scriptures to you, and I want them to settle on your heart. This is Leviticus 17, verse 11. For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. 
It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. <clears throat> All through this message, we've been saying that discipleship is a what? Bloody it's a bloody process. Do you need to get some blood in the offering today? Yeah. Do you need to die to yourself today? Yeah. Do you need to put down your selfishness and your pride today? Amen. Have you found out where you are in discipleship and you need to take ownership of it? Have you failed to see anything that's been taught from this pulpit the past six weeks and you, you don't know what we're talking about? Have you been seduced away to where you can't even hear the word being shared with you as a gift? You need to get some blood in the offering today. Listen to Hebrews 9.22. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. How can you be forgiven if you cannot shed your blood? If you're holding on to your very life, how will you get that, for, that forgiveness? This is the very thing that we're being taught in discipleship. It's a bloody process. Yeah. Yeah. The type of life that we're entering into, to be initiated into, just like Buddy, just like Brent, it is a bloody process. Yeah. Buddy, do you have some blood in the offering today? Do you want to put more? Is Jesus worth more? Yeah. It is a bloody process. The gospel is a bloody process. We have to lay everything down for the sake of Christ, so that others may be brought into the kingdom. Amen. Turn to Matthew 28. Amen. It's a really good word. What I can't shake is in, in Leviticus 17, in the latter part of that verse, it says, it is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Yeah. I can't shake that. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Is everybody in Matthew 28? Yeah. You notice in Matthew 28, we start off with Matthew 28. We started off and we're ending here. It's for a reason. In Matthew 28, verse 16, then Jesus, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. Say go. Go. And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. I want you guys to, to look, at, look at this from the illusion of the first time. What's happening here? Jesus has died, he's resurrected, he's getting ready to be taken back into heaven. And he's saying, now I'm sending you forth to go forth and to make disciples. Could you imagine what they felt in that moment? They've been with him for three and a half years now. And he's getting ready to leave them. They're probably terrified that Jesus was going away. Maybe some doubt came out that they couldn't do it, but Jesus is here telling them, I am sending you. Elsim, if, if God has put you in this church... I can't say this enough. It's for a reason. Yeah. It's because he is sending you somewhere. He's sending you to be discipled. He, he's sending you here to be discipled, to go forth and to make disciples of all nations. The thing is, when, you, when you're being initiated, it requires you that when you become initiated, like Buddy Brasso, like Brent Vincent, you leave the, the daily direction you get all the time here. When you've been sent out to another nation, you don't have this anymore. It comes to an end. You become accountable, just like your pastors. You become accountable to them like a peer. They treat you like one of them. And it's a bloody process. What's interesting about this is that Jesus has just died. He has come back to initiate his disciples into death. When initiated, you're being taken into your death. It's a bloody process to the bloody door of initiation. What was Jesus calling? He was called into the world to die. He was called into the world to die, and here he is resurrected, and he's calling his disciples to do what? To go out and die. Yeah. To go out and die. But you know what's so interesting about this? Is that out of their death, 
nations are liberated. Yeah. Out of their death, men are set free. Yeah. Out of their death, men and women are calling on the name of Jesus Christ. Yeah. You know why? Because when Jesus was sent into the world, he didn't just die. He resurrected and he gave these men life. And now he's sending them and saying, go forth and make disciples. Do exactly what I've done for you. It's a bloody process and it's, required, it's going to require everything that you have. So think about this, LCM. What in the process is preventing you from getting initiated? What in the process, where are you that is, is preventing you to, from getting to this point? Getting to the point where you're fully ready to be sent out. Fully, fully ready to be recognized as, as a pastor, as a peer, as a, as a pillar in this church. We already told you that was a bloody process. You have to ask yourself, LCM, how do I need to bleed today? You know why? It's the only way to life. Stand to your feet.